Hi there, my name is Dr. Mitchell Culver, and I'm here to talk to you about low effort, high impact teaching strategies from a remote based learning environment. I manage what's called the Center for Student Analytics here at Utah State University. And this web series or this webinar is a first part of a web series that we're providing in partnership with the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence. It's called the Remote Teaching and Learning Analytics web series. And the goal is to use latest approaches in learning analytics and the learning sciences to help faculty optimize their course for remote delivery. Obviously, we're in the situation of COVID-19 and there's widespread quarantine and widespread remote teaching and learning. And so uh, the university decided that it would be useful to develop this web series to help faculty kind of tune their expectations and get some best practices, research-based uh, best practices into their classes. And so this is meant to be a quick webinar, asynchronous, so you can watch it in parts if you need to step away. But the goal here is, is to just provide you with some quick uh, teaching tips that will help you to, to hone and craft a better uh, classroom experience. Now, low effort, high impact. We know that faculty right now are under a great deal of stress. The move to online has been challenging for everyone involved in the university. And so we wanted there to be these optimization opportunities, but we also, and, and high impact, but we also knew that they needed to be low effort. So everything that's in this webinar should be fairly easy to implement without much work on your, your behalf as a faculty member. The first thing I want to do is just thank you all as faculty members. The move to remote-based teaching has been challenging, but we appreciate your efforts uh, because you've already done a lot to make this semester work for your students. I also at the bottom here want to especially thank uh, other units that have made this webinar series pop possible. So Empowering Teaching Excellence, the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction, also called CITI, University Marketing and Communications, Teaching and Learning Technology, Media Production, and the Office of the Provost. We we have this goal that we, we want to, to convey to you that these little things, these low effort, high impact practices that you can do in your class are only grounded in the literature, but we know that your influence as instructors really matters, that you make a difference, that the decisions you make on behalf of your students in the teaching environment are some of the most important uh, for their experiences and having a good experience with the university. So. One of the things that I always like to convey to faculty when I speak to them is this, this IEO model. So I stands for inputs, E is environments, and O is outcomes. And this was developed by Alexander Aston. He's a higher education researcher. And what he said is, is that when we look at the way higher education works, educational environments work, students bring with them a whole slew of different skill sets that they're already prepared, a certain level of preparedness when they arrive to our universities, right? So high school GPA, their work ethic, beliefs about education, their motivation, and all these things. Those are going to impact their outcomes, whether or not we do a great job. And so that's why this bottom orange arrow leads over to that green box. However, the environment we provide for our students, called the student environment, is also influential. And that's why there's this blue arrow. Both what the student brings with them and what we provide combine together to get the student the outcome. Well, why bother talking about this? Well, it's very important that instructors understand that they do make a difference. I'm disheartened when I hear instructors say, regardless of what I do, the students come into my class, they're, they're preset to get one outcome or another, and what I do doesn't make a difference. The research absolutely doesn't support that in any way, shape, or form. What we know, so all the research um, about high quality instruction is, is that if you have two students who arrive to the institution, with very similar student input. So student A and B, they're both orange here because they both have a similar background and makeup, okay? And you put them into two different instructional environments. One, high quality, this purple quality, and then yellow, less high quality instructional environment. You get two very different outcomes. We know that this is the case. Um, and so this is just a, a kind of a complex framework of saying faculty matter, what you do in the classroom matters. And so when it comes to these remote-based teaching environments, what you do matters. And that's what this webinar is grounded in. We at the Center for Student Analytics like to convey practical ideas to the people that we serve. And in this case, we normally would take learning analytics and then kind of transform those by learning sciences, combine them together, and then suggest practical ideas to you. But we're in a bit of a unique situation right now because learning analytics are based on having some kind of history. Uh, 
most learning analytics are based on large sets of data that have existed in historical time. We process those and then we generate insights. I was talking with one of the vice presidents and he said, you know, it's, it's going to be great. All the insights that you're going to be able to produce after this episode of COVID-19 and all the quarantine and remote teaching. And my brain went, well, the problem is that we, we, we don't have a lot of data. We're new into this situation and all of the calendar years of data and experience in our big data sets that lead up to this event aren't actually going to, are not actually that informative to what's happening now. And so we're kind of flying blind right now as analysts. We don't know how this is all going to play out. So we're very curious. Well, my training as a, uh, a data scientist is, is, is that when you don't have really rich quantitative data, it's very, very um, productive to begin with qualitative data. You have to start somewhere. A lot of times the things that we have come to know that we need to measure in higher education actually started out as a qualitative or anecdotal experience in the higher education space. And so my initial kind of gut reaction was, if we don't have a large history of a big data set, we're gonna need qualitative data. And what that means is student feedback. So I've been running some student focus groups over the last week. And uh, the practical ideas that we're presenting in this particular session and in perhaps other sessions of the web series are going to be that qualitative data, that student feedback, transformed by what we know as the, in the learning sciences, right? My, so my doctorate's in the learning sciences and combining those two to suggest practical teaching tips for you as instructors here in this remote based teaching environment, this new world and age that we're in. A little bit about my background. I am currently the manager of the Center for Student Analytics, but I'm also an assistant professor in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership. I've been teaching higher education college classes for 10 years. I have experience teaching in face-to-face, -face, broadcast, online, and seminar format, you know, all day, you know, Saturday kind of seminars. And so I, I want you to know that, that these practical ideas are really meant to be really actually high impact and grounded in uh, a good foundation, uh, combining the student feedback that we've recently received and the learning sciences. Now, one of the most insightful things that a student had said over the past week in these sessions, these focus group sessions that I've been running, and basically, so you know, the focus group sessions, I basically start, it's a semi-structured interview, start with the question, I want to learn about your experiences over the last month and your impressions about the future. And then through 10 questions in a semi-structured interview, groups of one to four students kind of unpack what's been going on for them. Well, one of these students shared this idea, crisis amplifies the impact of our actions, good or bad. And I thought that was so, and I'm paraphrasing a bit there, but that was so insightful that what he was saying was, in my faculty, in this situation, when they do a small good thing, it actually isn't small, it actually is amplified. It means a great deal to me. When they do a small bad thing, like something that impacts me negatively or comes off maybe the wrong way or comes off in a negative way, that is amplified also. And I think that this webinar in particular, this session is going to talk about how we can avoid those small bad things and through very simple efforts, do some small good things that actually will be amplified because of the nature of the situation that we're in. So the four teaching strategies that we're gonna cover in this session are providing authentic encouragement and reassurance, especially now quickly, Canvas skills development, soliciting formative feedback from your students, and flexi having flexibility in grading and deadlines. So to get into that first one, authentic encouragement and reassurance, what do we mean by this? Well, here's two comments from two different students. One said, some of my faculty have been reassuring while others have been radio silent. And other students in that same session said, I haven't heard anything from my faculty. Like, I, you know, I'm jealous of this other student who has at least some of their faculty being reassuring. Um, one student said, I feel like we've been put aside. I feel like we, you know, we've moved online and we're just supposed to deal with it. And I, I, there's been messaging from the, you know, like the president and the emails and ever, all the students actually have said that those emails have been great. The video that the president put out, which was very short, but very impactful. The students have had, um, very positive reaction to that short video. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But they said, you know, this it's been a little bit of, uh, one, one student said it's been jarring, another student said it's been hectic. And so they're looking for some kind of 
authentic reassurance from the faculty members. Often, we know from literature, often faculty exclusively facilitate students' cognitive engagement in the course material. However, these authors found that students' grades in a course are meaningfully associated with their emotional engagement in the course as well. It's not exclusively these authors, this is just a sample. Um, so our recommendation to faculty based on these insights is, is that you film quickly, this week or next, early next week, film a short video, it could be three to seven minutes, that offers students your perspective on the situation of crisis. Students want to be influenced by faculty and they want to hear what you're thinking, what you're experiencing, what your view is on this whole situation, how you can give them a message of hope or optimism and help them to have some practical uh, strategies of, of dealing with this next month as the semester concludes. Uh, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the content generation. These students that I'm speaking with are primarily Generation Z, the I generation, or also known as the content generation. They want the, the, the kind of generational cohort theory suggests that our students want engaging, authentic content that is brief, emotionally invested, and not overly produced. And what do I mean not overly produced? So I don't know if you've recently seen this video by John Krasinski, who became famous on The Office. SGN stands for Some Good News. And the goal of these YouTube videos that he makes is to just share some good things that are happening in the coronavirus situation. You can read all the bad news in the regular papers, but this is a goal is to say, hey, there's some good things happening too. Um, not overly produced, he's, he's in a suit and a tie there, but you learn in the video that is filmed there that he's actually wearing board shorts, like jam shorts. And, and then his daughters made the SGN like finger painted sign there, right? So not overly produced, he's literally sitting in front of his webcam. It's him alone in a room, very much like I'm sitting here alone talking to you. It's not meant to be this big production, right? Another example of this is the comedian, Jim Gaffigan. He, with um, uh, some charity organizations on YouTube, for an extended period of time, every night with his family, did what was called Dinner with the Gaffigans. And at the start, he, he, he just carries his cell phone around and films himself and films his family eating dinner every night. It's about 45 minutes long, you can watch them. It starts with his daughter kind of playing a jazzy tune on the piano and Jim is there singing Dinner with the Gaffigans. You know, it's just completely made up on the spot. It's not meant to be this big production, but it's very authentic. It has a lot of views and it's it's what our, our current generation of students is responding well to. These not overly produced, very simple, very straightforward, authentic kind of uh, episodes. Now, the best example of this is on the app that's very popular now called TikTok. This is Charlie D'Amelio. Charlie is a 15, 16 year old girl from the East Coast. A year ago, she had 90 followers on TikTok, 90 followers, just her friends from high school, right? And now she has 40 million followers a year later. And Charlie, so she is actually currently the most prolific and prominent content generator in the world. This 15 year old girl out in Connecticut or Rhode Island or wherever she is. And you can see the, the image here is she just dances for 15 seconds, you know, three or four times a day in front of this camera. And then it uploads to the app and people watch it and they get excited. Simple dances that people can learn themselves. The point that I'm trying to tell you here is I want you to notice what's going on with Charlie in this particular picture. Her bed's not made, there's laundry on the floor, she's in probably what her, is her pajamas, she has a messy bun. She is not trying to impress anyone. She's just being authentic. And she now is the most prominent content creator because of that authenticity, that, that kind of man behind the curtain, so to speak, if you if you remember the Wizard of Oz. And so the recommendation here is this authentic encouragement and reassurance to our students, filming short videos. The recommendation, this is weird. I never thought I would say this. I've been mean, getting into higher education and doing training like this, but my recommendation is be like Charlie DiMelio. And what do I mean by that? Some of the students have said um, in these focus groups, one said, I would connect with seeing my professor in their basement, meaning if they were just filming like naturally, that would be reassuring. It would help me to know that they, they don't, they're not stuck up, that they're not prideful, that they just are doing everything that I'm doing. They're just dealing with it. One student said, I just want to know they care. I don't care. You know, if they made an announcement and it wasn't long, it wasn't even about class. It was just about, hey, keep up the good work. That would mean a lot to me. And when they're talking, these are pretty emotionally invested comments, right? So so this isn't just like surface level content. This is when students are kind of revealing what they really 
actually deep down feel. One student said, it's a different kind of situation and we appreciate getting their clarity on the expectations and a forecast of what the next month is going to look like. What they're expressing is a little bit of uncertainty and they feel like even if you are uncertain, hearing from you about that is gonna strengthen them. The, the next one is, it would be helpful if they could explain that they are going to be flexible with us so we don't have to worry as much and sweat the small things. This is actually a theme that came up a lot. So I took all these interviews and kind of did content analysis. One of the themes was this idea of, I'm uncertain if I miss a deadline or if I do something wrong or the tech doesn't work right in my remote learning experience, I'm worried my professor is gonna drop the hammer. And maybe they won't ever drop the hammer, but not knowing whether or not they're gonna drop the hammer on me is really actually very stressful. And so I'm freaking out and, and that's not helpful to my learning, right? We know that's true. So Charlie, be like Charlie, right? She does 15 to 60 seconds multiple times a day. My recommendation is, is that you do one three to seven minute video sometime in this next week. And you can do additional videos. I think students would, would benefit from that. But the goal here is not to be overly produced. Literally turn on your webcam, sit down, pound out a message and send it over the announcement or whatever it is. And if you need help, you can always reach out to the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction. They have a huge team that's willing to provide you support um, and say, oh, I don't know how to upload a video or I don't know how to click, where do I click? They can help you with that. Now, the second recommendation that we have in this time is Canvas skills development. Maybe you're new to Canvas, maybe you're an old veteran of Canvas. The students have said that some of their faculty are doing really nicely with Canvas. Um, and others are not, and you probably know who you are. Um, this one student said, I just wish my faculty would get some Canvas skills. We know from our research in the Center for Student Analytics that when faculty are using all the features of, uh, like in this example, design tools is a, a set of features in Canvas that you can work with instructional designers to build really pretty courses, but any kind of savviness that faculty have with Canvas really helps their students uh, to improve their grades. So. We also found an interaction effect in this particular study where first generation students were particularly benefited when their faculty was savvy with Canvas. So what's our recommendation? Well, if you're new to you, if you're new to Canvas, you can go and do a YouTube search. And just this last month, the Center for Innovative Design and Instruction, Erin Wadsworth Anderson, who's an instructional designer there, she uploaded this video called Beginner's Guide to Canvas, hashtag keep teaching. And so if you go to YouTube and just search that, and include the hashtag keep teaching, which I think will differentiate her video from the others. This is her video, it's 19 minutes long. It's a quick breezy introduction to Canvas, Beginner's Guide to Canvas, Keep Teaching. So if you haven't watched that, we encourage you to do that. Uh, and right now it has 20 views, I'm gonna watch that closely. So if it gets to like, you know, 400, I'll be pretty excited, okay? Uh, also, the uh, Empowering Teaching Excellence program is going to build this website. This is kind of a mock-up design. It's going to release either today or tomorrow. So this website may not be up and running just yet, but keep checking usu.edu slash empower teaching slash remote teaching. And it's this guide of really pithy uh, quick tips about how to get the best of your remote teaching experience. So. Even if you're a veteran, I think this website is gonna help you to kind of hone your craft in this remote teaching environment, not just for this semester and this next month, but into the summer. We know the first half of summer at least is going to be completely remote. And then perhaps the second half and then into fall, if the quarantine continues, we obviously the best case scenario is, is that we're back to regular instruction by midsummer. but we are watching everything closely as you probably are. And we want everyone to kind of be familiar with the best remote teaching techniques as this unfolds. The third recommendation we have for you is to solicit formative feedback from your students. Uh, this is one student's comment in this focus group. A lot of the approaches that faculty have used in the past work because they have years of experience trying them out. Some of the approaches they're using right now, they have never used before. So they haven't worked out the kinks. So it would be nice if they asked for our feedback, especially if this coronavirus quarantine is going to continue. So the idea here is, is they have understanding that you're, you're doing some new things, you're trying some things out. They have opinions about those things you're trying, and they would love it if you'd solicit their feedback. And we know this term formative feedback is from the learning sciences literature. And what it means for those who may not be familiar is there's two types of feedback uh, or assessments. Summative assessment would be the tests that you provide at the end of 
the semester. You know, it's summative meaning it's the culmination of all their learning. Formative assessment is along the way, how you figure out and signal to the students how well they're doing. You know, a midterm, you can tell students, hey, formatively, you're not on track to get a good grade, and I would like you to do these things to get better. Well, that's assessment. Feedback works the same way. Summative feedback would be your idea evaluations at the end of the semester that you get, and you get to evaluate, you say, okay, how did it go? Formative feedback is opportunities to provide feedback for your students to give you feedback along the way. Well, how do you do that? The recommendation that we have, and some faculty have already done this with good results, is that you create a Qualtrics survey. That's if you want anonymous responses. So hop into qualtrics.usu.edu and build out a quick survey, send it to your students, and that would be anonymous response. Or you can do in Canvas, you can just build an ungraded quiz and just tell students, this is a quiz I want you to take, it's ungraded, I'd like your feedback. Now that is obviously going to be tied to their identity, not anonymous, but that might actually be okay. Uh, now I've been building lots of feedback surveys for maybe 10 years now and a lot of different settings. And my favorite form of a formative survey is just three questions, keep it simple, uh, literally, this is what's called the plus delta method, right? What has been going well? So positive things. What could be going better? That's delta. Delta is the Greek symbol for change, right? What would you like to see changed? And then three, is there anything else you'd like to share? And I always put number three in there just as a catch-all. And then it's this qualitative feedback that uh, basically the students are going to kind of let you know how they're feeling about what's going on. And you see that this is pretty quick and easy, uh, and then you'll catch a lot of the things that you can update or change. Um, try not to take their feedback personally, uh, remain solution focused, right? That's why we try to, this question two, it's not what do you hate, it's what could be better because it forces them to kind of think in a solution focused way, like how can I improve or help my faculty to improve the situation? So we really encourage you to solicit that formative feedback. Now the last recommendation, the fourth recommendation we want to make in this webinar is be flexible in grading and in deadlines. Now, this is one of the most uh, kind of mature things that I think a student said in these focus groups. Uh, they said, I just wish they'd realize students are being flexible with us. We should be flexible with them. And what that means is, is students, you know, they, they've been sent home from the university that they paid to come to. They've paid student fees. They're missing out on all of the activities and the social events and gatherings that they normally would have, all the services that they would normally have access to if they were on campus. They're sitting on their couches watching four or five recorded lectures a day, right? Depending on their faculty members, how many classes they're taking, they're watching your 45 minute lecture and the next class's 45 minute lecture. And you can say, well, that's fine. The, the reality is, is, is that that's what what's what's happening but but it's difficult to watch five hours of content all at once and it's difficult it's taxing on them and so you know we're all getting used to this we're all making adjustments so uh hold on my dog is scratching at the door and it's <laughs> Talk about authentic, right? Okay, so flexibility. So one of the things the student said is this idea is normally in a class, I'm able to ask questions in real time. Uh, I could empathize with the student in saying, okay, you know, when a student asks a question and the instructor's providing an answer, the instructor gets to see their face, gets to see expressions of confusion or clarity or understanding. And this one student said, you know, my, my professor said I could email back and forth through you know, some kind of email situation. But he's, he said, you know, going back and forth is not the same as just raising my hand and asking a question. And so, like, if I don't have opportunity to real-time Q&A, I may not get clarity on the finer points, even if I reach out by email. And so when I'm then performing on some kind of written assessment, if I don't have, if I'm not up to snuff, I wish my faculty would be a little bit more understanding that the quality of instruction has changed dramatically Therefore, the quality of our academic performance is also going to match that quality of change in the instruction. I think that's a fair point. Another thing that students brought up is, is that maybe on paper tests were one format and then now moving into an online space, maybe the faculty have switched questions out or maybe they don't have essay questions anymore. And so the students are still trying to adjust themselves. Like I got used to your tests the one way and was was getting you know better and better grades each time 
before we went to remote teaching. But now I'm all confused as to like, what, what are the strategies and tactics of being successful on these online exams? So you can understand there's a little bit of a, a shift there, probably for you as well, but also for your students. Some of the students talked about um, this idea that uh, the testing controls, normally, you know, maybe a test is closed note, closed book. And in the current situation, a faculty member might say, hey, you need to take this test, closed note, closed book. Well, high performing students are sitting there going, I know that I'm gonna take the test with integrity and close my notes and close my book, but I don't know that every other classmate's gonna do that. And this is a curved test. So if I'm honest and some of my classmates are dishonest, that's gonna hurt me, not because of my own fault. And so this lack of testing controls may necessitate, 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 necessitate changes to the testing pro protocol, right? So you would say, well, maybe everyone gets to take open book, open note, and that's just spring 2020. That's, you know, that's just the nature of spring 2020 is, is it was quarantine, right? Um, maybe, maybe you say, okay, well, um, you know, and there's different options like proctorial and these different things that you can set up and you can reach out to the testing center for more details. But the reality is, is, is that there may be some changes that need to be made, some flexibility of you saying, all right, what can I do to make sure that everyone's kind of getting a fair shake here? Uh, as, re as it relates to proctorial, one student said, you know, I have bad Wi-Fi, And so it, when I was on proct proctorial, that it was like, inter like the Wi-Fi was cutting out and then the proctorio was cutting out. And then I felt like the whole time I was frustrated because I didn't know whether or not my faculty member was going to be lenient when I explained this in an email. Like your instructor, I know my test score looks really awful or I know my proctorio results are weird, but my Wi-Fi is awful at home. I haven't had a chance to buy higher quality Wi-Fi. And so the technology isn't working. The students kind of, their their hope here is, is, is that faculty can be flexible and understanding and say, oh, okay, there's a lot of things happening that students have no control over and we need to be a little bit more flexible with them. Now, this is another example. The, the student didn't grasp the instructions the first time because they hadn't been gone over in, in class. Normally the teacher has gone through the instructions of each assignment. Well, now just reading through on Canvas wasn't sufficient for the student to, to, they missed something, right? And then when they got their grade back, they go, oh, obviously I missed that. And their request of the instructor was, hey, could I resubmit this? Like I didn't, your written instructions I missed because I'm not used to just reading written instructions. I'm used to you being able to explain in class and ask questions, but this, this didn't work, could I resubmit? And the instructor was just like, oh, no, of course not. Of course you can't resubmit. Well. Our, my advice to you is, is that a resubmission opportunity at times and in places would be gracious. That uh, if you're understanding that, that everyone is kind of adapting to this remote-based teaching and learning, um, being a little bit more gracious in your resubmission opportunities or, or your deadlines would be helpful. So students in multiple uh, focus group sessions, so independent of one another, um, they complained that faculty are using irregular submission times. So some in some of their classes, certain assignments are due at 5 p.m. or in another class, it's 12 p.m. And they said, with everything moving online, five, six classes, it's hard for me to monitor. Like, when is what class due and what time? And so for their kind of peace of mind, it sure would be nice if all of those were set to 11.59. Now, I hate 11.59 as an instructor. I've always used the start of class as my submission time. But I actually was impressed that the students said, you know, the, I we could understand that 1159 is not ideal because our faculty want us to go to bed. They want us to get sleep. They don't want us doing homework at 11 o'clock at night. So that's why they're using these other 5 p.m., 12 p.m. submission times. But they said for this next month, it really would take a load off if everything was just due 1159 standards so that we didn't have to like do mental gymnastics in our scheduling to remember. And partly that that's because there's such a tax of uncertainty on everyone's mind these days. They're just asking for a little bit more consistency. I think in a normal semester, you could have different various times like I do, and my students don't seem to have a problem with it. So I think it's just for this, uh, we, what we're saying is the students need a dispensation. You need to maybe um, consider setting 1159 as the submission time. 
The last one that came up in, in sessions from people who didn't even have children, they said, you know, with everything going on, there's, I have classmates who I know have kids and for them, their kids are at home because of school closures. This is awful. And so they're probably going to need dramatic leniency in terms of making sure that faculty understand that when everything stacks up on these students, some of the things are just going to fall off the plate. And so they said, you know, maybe it would be cool if instructors were to set, you know, here's the submission deadline, but anything you submit within a week of the deadline won't be considered late or something like that. So that students can actually start to schedule out their, their cadence of their work such that they can get a best result for, for their efforts. So that's, I thought was pretty, um, pretty reasonable. The recommendation here in the webinar here is to think of spring 2020 as a trial run and adapt appropriately. None of us have had to do what we're doing right now. Faculty, all of the administrators and staff at the university, the students themselves. Uh, and so because we're new to this, this very much feels like a trial run. We're learning the rules of this game. Uh, and so to be lenient in this learning period is actually gonna be really important to helping students feel supported. One of the students said this, and this is a final thought for this webinar, is this, as I think about going into next semester, meaning fall, with the possibility that this will all still be going on. I know that having a positive experience now will help me to know that I'm going to be fine in the future. And this was this kind of impressions about the future. Students are uncertain about the future, but the clear difference between students who are worried and may feel like they need to leave the institution come fall and, and maybe leave meaning take a break. You know, they said, if we're gonna still be online in fall, maybe I'll just take a semester off or something like this compared to other students who said, oh, of course I'll sign up for classes, but it's because I'm having such a positive experience now. What you do as instructors matters. It's not only gonna matter for your students in your current courses, but it's gonna matter for the entire community of the university as we look at fall enrollments, as we look at being able to be supportive of students in this time of crisis. I heard in the news that a lot of uh, smaller private schools, more on the East Coast, are just considering closing down for fall. Say, oh, we're not gonna do this whole remote teaching thing. And I think it's really awesome that the Utah State Aggie family has come together, pulled together to make online remote-based teaching possible. And we want you to be a part of that. We really are appreciative of your efforts as faculty to make this next four weeks of this month of April really stellar and excellent for your students. These recommendations come not only just from those student voices, but from research-based best practices in the learning sciences. We think they're low effort, high impact, and we really appreciate you taking the time to watch this webinar. If you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me directly. I'm at mitchell.culver at usu.edu. Also, Travis Thurston, who runs the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence. We're really thankful to our faculty, to our administrators and staff, for the hard work that they're doing in this time of difficulty and challenge for everyone. And we're also really thankful for the students who contributed their voices to make this webinar possible. Thanks so much and have a good month.